Hey everyone, Stephanie here. Just wanted to give you a heads up. Physical and mental trauma is a theme in today's episode as we talk about Frida Kahlo. If it is something you're not up for today, that's okay. It will be here whenever you're ready for it. Okay, on with the show. Welcome to Art Slice, a palatable serving of art history. I'm Stephanie Duenas. And I'm Russell Shoemaker. And welcome. Welcome, new listeners. If you're just joining us for the first time, we are an art history podcast. Uh, but we're not two crusty, pipe smoking okay. art historians <laughs> about to die alone under a stack of textbooks that are just like kind of wobbling precariously next to us. No, we're under these chilly lights. We're sipping from tiki glasses. We're having fun <laughs> until we get serious. And we have to decide, listeners, if the work we talk about belongs in our Art Slice Museum on the Art Slice Hilltop, surrounded by the candy and condom moats. So, Stephanie, what are we talking about today? Today, it's part two of Ooh. Diego and Frida. Friego, no. if you will. No, I thought we talked about this. We weren't going to do this. We weren't going to combine their names. Yes, we are. <laughs> it's about their time in the Motor City. Last time, we talked about the Detroit Industry murals by Diego, and this week we will discuss Frida's self-portrait on the border between Mexico and the United States from 1932, a painting of oil on tin. First of all, listeners, we, Stephanie and I, need to apologize. We do. Yeah, we need to, we fucked up. We We, fucked up. We did. We fucked up, listeners. Is it because we're late again? Part of it. Not really, well, yeah, kind of. (laughs) No, we gave, uh, we gave some incorrect information. So we're late liars. Diego, Steph, Diego Rivera from last episode. Yeah, I remember him, that guy, yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't that tall. (laughs) I thought you were going to say he wasn't a communist, everybody. Yeah, that would have been a big mistake. But we made even a bigger mistake, (laughs) a big baby mistake, a Diego-sized mistake. He wasn't that (laughs) tall. And by the way, I'm not fat shaming Diego Rivera. He looks like a big baby. He's very childlike. Yeah, he's very charming. Charming and childlike. Yeah, charming, childlike. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, he wasn't that tall. I thought he was like eight foot tall or seven foot tall at least. Maybe we made him seem like he was eight feet tall. Yeah, he's he's shorter than me. Well, you're pretty tall though. Yeah, I'm not that tall. To be fair though, it's 1932. uh, Everyone was like 5'9". Everyone's a little bit shorter. Yeah, so maybe proportionally he's like Shaquille O'Neal at this point. (laughs) Oh my gosh. But we're sorry, listeners. Look, we have a big episode to get to, so we won't waste any more of your time. Um, But just a heads up that this might go over an hour. We're really trying hard to keep episodes under an hour, but Frida, that's all I'm going to say. Frida. Frida's a beast. I I thought because we had so many resources on her, it wouldn't be an issue. Usually we have the opposite problem where there's just not a lot of resources to draw from. Right, no, we are... We were digging through T-shirts and handbags and arts and crafts and yeah. earrings. Frida uh, cell phone cases. Yeah, did I not say they were? Frida they all had Frida murals. space on on everything. We Frida just, earrings. Frida. Frida everything. hand clutches. Koozies, coasters, mugs, mouse pads, screensavers, so coin Fr- purses. Frida's a beast. That's why it took us a while to release it because we want to give you a good Frida episode. And we're only we're only discussing one year of her life. Hair clips. You, you got more socks. Okay. Well, let's dig in. Converse. Listeners, we highly recommend that you Sunglasses. pull up the images at either artsizepod.com or artsizepod on Instagram Backpack. because there's going to be a lot of images that earrings. we talk about today. Necklaces, rings, nail art, bracelets, tattoos, Day of the Dead, Frida, tattoos. It's the 4th of July in Detroit, 1932. The colorful bursts in the night sky could be seen from terraces of the well-kept homes of the Detroit socialites and from the shanty towns of the growing homeless alike. Frida Kahlo is being rushed to the emergency room, covered in blood. Diego Rivera, after a 10 or 12 hour day of working on the Detroit industry murals at the DIA, almost missed the brightly lit sky. He caught a quick glimpse and was reminded of Frida, and how she loved fireworks. And with that, he rushed into a taxi and headed toward the Henry Ford Hospital, funded and named after the most famous man in Detroit. Frida noticed a different display. Her pain was masked with morphine, ether, and nitrous oxide, leading her to hallucinate, Mira, que precioso, 
she said to Diego, Look, how beautiful, as he rushed by her side. Frida was no stranger to physical pain. She had learned to cope with constant pain from an early age. When the colorful ceilings faded, she was, in her mind, reborn. Thousands of miles from her home in Mexico, two days before her 26th birthday, trapped in the hospital that modern industry built. Okay, so let's go back to 1931 in San Francisco. If you remember, listeners, like we discussed in the last episode, this is Frida's first experience in the USA, a city she fell head over heels for. While Diego is busy working insane hours on his mural commissions, she is exploring the city in her Mexican Tijuana dress and rebosos, strolling by the Embarcadero, the gardens, soaking up the chilly ocean air. Frida loved how multicultural San Francisco was, and Chinatown was one of her favorite places. She especially loved the firecrackers during Chinese New Year because it reminded her of Mexican street fairs back home. At this point in her life, she has been painting on and off for several years. Mm. She was never formally trained. She was self-taught, but through Diego's San Francisco commissions, she meets all sorts of intellectuals and artists, with San Francisco being a more open-minded city. And while Frida is still thought of as Diego's wife, she is being treated like her own person. So Frida becomes part of a women's artist circle where she participated in weekly hangouts which helped Frida experiment and to find her artistic feet. Two of those artists included Pella DeLapp and Lucille Blanche. Is that how you say it? I don't know how you say it. <laughs> is that, I, I'm butchering it anyway. Hi, y'all. My name is Pella DeLapp. Okay, look, let me try this accent. Are you ready? Yeah. Pella DeLapp. Okay. Pella DeLappe. Okay. And Lucille Blanche. I don't know. All right, I have a quote from Pele. We would draw these composite drawings where each one would start on a particular sheet of paper and then trade them off and pass them around. The sketches were usually very obscene or horrendous and bloody or sensuous in some way. Okay. End quote. It's starting to sound like a Frida Kahlo painting. Kind of, right? Bloody and sensuous. Well, she did want to be a doctor and then a medical illustrator at some point. So she was totally okay with bloody yeah. guts and love and all that. Blood, guts, and love. Yes. Yeah. And Frida knew her stuff, too. She was very serious about studying anatomical illustrations. Doctors have actually studied her work and said that you can tell she knew a lot about anatomy because of how her depictions of bodies and organs were all scientifically accurate. We have a little a little image here of a sketch she made around this time called Entrañas. Yeah. Just like guts. Yeah, it's a, it's, a <laughs> it's the hips, voluptuous hips, and then uh, you see guts. Honestly, it just looks like a vase with a bunch of shapes in it. Okay. If I'm... I see sensuous hips. Okay. Like I, but I see those everywhere, to be fair. <laughs> it's the power of my male gaze, Stephanie. <laughs> So, bearing in mind that Frida's fascinated by human anatomy, and now that she's had some practice putting those interests and skills on paper, I just want to talk about an example that reminds me of something similar that she did to the guts drawing. This uh, David Lynch man standing behind a <laughs> no. monster plant? No, no. And now I can't unsee it. I, I truly can't unsee it. If you were wearing a brown suit, yes. Yes. No. David Lynch wouldn't wear a brown suit, though. That's what I'm saying. If you're wearing a brown suit, but he's not. We are looking at Portrait of Luther Burbank from 1931. This is a painting that Frida did while in San Francisco. He was a horticulturist and Mm. he was known for creating all kinds of hybrid fruits. Mr. David Lynch here, he is turning into a tree (laughs) and the tree's roots are coming out of or going into a decomposing body, which is clear and you can see the the blood and guts and stuff and the skeletal system inside of it. It's just a, it's a really interesting composition. So this is a cutaway yeah. of the ground. Right. It's kind of like The House Opposite by mm. Lenore Carrington, which actually she did this 
in a couple of her paintings, at least, where she cut away at the ground and you can see underneath the ground. Just kind yeah, of yeah, that's something I would do as a kid a lot. Draw the like cutaways. Awesome. Yeah, Aww. I love doing that. Did you ever do that? Is that a kid thing? That's a you thing, okay. not me. I think <laughs> I think every kid's different. I think I just thought about worms in the ground. Yeah, exactly. So you, like, you make the little worm tracks. No, okay. that was not me. No. Anyway, that is who Luther Burbank is, right? He's this hybrid magician sort of guy, scientist, magician. But he's really making it though. That's the yeah. thing. It's not an illusion at all. Um, and you're, you're starting to see some Frida themes here, right? There's the macabre. There's the power of nature. A huge theme for Frida that will come along in her work a little bit later is duality. She's very mm. interested in the theme of duality. Everything has an opposite. That's an influence from Mexican culture. So Frida was just fascinated by the fact that somebody in real life like made a new fruit, right? Yeah. <laughs> she just loved it. So she was inspired to make this portrait of a man she'd never met, right? It's totally out of her imagination. Luther Burbank was buried in his garden. I think the cycle of life in nature really interested young Frida. Also, death, as we will see, death is something that reoccurs in Frida's work. Also, Frida's colors are starting to come through. Her bright, citrusy earth tones. Yeah. That you know, she's known for, those citrusy colors. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's a young artist here, but her skills, they're really shining through. So during Frida's time in San Francisco, she's also learning what it means to be Diego's wife. So they're newlyweds at this point? Yeah. Okay. Eh, more or less. But so she's just learning about married life, but then also like married life with Diego. <laughs> Well, he he was a great artist, um, you know, the size and scale of his murals and then all the deadlines and his insistence on putting, you know, communism in everything. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, hold. What? Sorry, I had to play the communist theme song again. Diego is moody, basically, is what's what's he happening. He didn't handle his stress well, which, I mean, to be fair, if I was doing a big-ass mural, yeah, I mean, I would be stressed out, too. This was, like, a before Frida thing. Apparently, like, his mom was also terrified of his moods, and it was yeah. only his dad who could, like, chill him out. Well, that's that's not great. I mean, he's a big man. Yeah. Like, if he's volatile, he's I mean, run away. Run yeah. away. I don't want to be near the turpentine. He's a big boy. He's not, he's not as big as we thought, the... though. Let's be clear about that. I want to apologize, listeners, once again. He's not as tall as we thought. <laughs> Diego is really stressed out and Frida's just like oh my gosh how can I be there for you how can I you know be a good wife a good partner whatever part of that for her was to accompany Diego and socialize with his wealthy patrons so she was surrounded by millionaires she was in their luxurious homes and she was being served by you know their hired help this didn't sit well with Frida because she like Diego was a communist. But both Diego and Frida needed the commission money. They were not in a position to turn down an income, and she believed in Diego's work and his ability to inspire people politically. So she was going to be the good wife and play along. Okay, so around this time, Frida starts to dress more Western instead of... Like a cowboy hat? <laughs> no. Like Martin Wong? No. Okay. Although she would rock that look. She would, I gotta she, say. She would give uh, Martin Wong a run for his money with a mustache. Yep. Um... <laughs> Okay. She felt as if she had to start dressing more European, more Western in that sense. Okay. Instead of, you know, those jaw-dropping, traffic-stopping outfits, the traditional Tawana outfits that she was wearing in San Francisco mm -hmm. because she was being teased slash made fun of in New York because, you know, that's just how um, the people were that she hung around with, those yeah. wealthy patrons. Both Frida and Diego began to notice the glaring wealth inequality in the U.S. So first in San Francisco mm -hmm. and then especially when they moved to New York. New York? Mm -hmm. New York City. New York City. Frida told her mother, quote, witnessing the horrible poverty here and the millions of people who have no work, food, or home, who are cold and have no hope in this country of scumbag millionaires who greedily grab everything has profoundly shocked us. Yeah, I mean, the, the wealth inequality, while I'm, there was plenty of wealth inequality in Mexico, uh, I mean, it's amped up to like 10,000 and... New York City, especially. New York City, especially. New York City. They even visited a homeless shelter mm -hmm. where they saw people sleeping right. like dogs in a pen. So this experience inspired Diego to portray it in his painting called Frozen Assets, 
for his one man solo show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, which is the whole mm. reason they were there at this time. So bodies were placed side by side as if in a morgue hidden away underground in, gotcha. this, in this mural painting. Frozen Assets, by the way, listeners, is just it, it is an amazing fuck you to the very same wealthy patrons that funded Diego and NYC. And, you know, like I said before, it is really amazing that Diego was able to get away with this for as long as he did. Agreed. It's cut up into three parts. The top are the, uh, the skyline of New York City. Mm. The middle is this morgue, right, where all the bodies it's are a homeless placed. homeless shelter, to... but it does look like a morgue. Yeah. yeah. And then the bottom is and they're like, like a waiting lo- they're room. they're like locked away. I mean, I guess it's like a bank vault It's like a bank, something. right. Yeah, but there's also a security guard like watching over the homeless people. So all of that is happening underneath a city that is still building new structures, right? Like you can see yeah. the unfinished Rockefeller Center right in the center there. And Diego's saying like, well, look, you got these fucking buildings here. Like, why aren't these people sleeping in like rooms? Why aren't they sleeping in rooms or why can't we pay for them right. to, you know, not be hungry anymore and etc. But he was able to sneak this into his show because the show was already open, his one man show. Mm. Like everything's up and he actually kept painting and he just kind of like probably like snuck it in there. Like, yes, don't look at other, this one. Uh, Mexican murals did that when they were uh, painting murals in the United States too. Really? Yeah. David Alfaro Siqueiros? Yes, that guy. So to Frida, it seemed that the wealthy people that she was around didn't seem too bothered about the poverty, the hunger and the sickness that was plaguing people right outside of their high rises. Yeah. And she also told her mother that even Diego had started to hate this country a little. Yeah. So Diego lot, who had this like romantic vision of this country leading to communism eventually. He was like, no, this is actually this is pretty fucked this up. It's pretty bad. This issue of complacency among the rich did not sit well with Frida. Quote, Unfortunately, he has to work for these filthy rich asses. <laughs> and I have no choice but to put up with them since they are the one who buy paintings, end quote. Uh, it's so, I mean, it's, it's, it's true. true. That's also another great uh, Frida diss track available <laughs> yeah. on SoundCloud. Social justice was something that Frida encountered at an early age. This was in her... Yeah, this is in her blood. Yes. During the Mexican Revolution, back in Mexico... Her mom would feed and hide the Zapatista soldiers mm. in the Casa Azul, her childhood home in Coyacan, which was outside of Mexico City. So right. she saw it firsthand. She learned by example, yep. if you will. And the Zapatistas listeners, a little politicky quickie, they were a liberation army who were crucial to the Mexican Civil War. They fought for the land that had been taken from the farmers and the working class. Yes. So this is why Frida lied about her birth year. She was born in 1907, <laughs> but she really wanted to be associated with the revolution. I mean, she's watching her mom's example and she was probably like, hell yeah, like I want to too, right? I want to be a part of it too. So she lied and said she was born in 1910. That way she could literally be a child of the revolution. She was born right at that point. In Frida's mind, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a much more romantic story, the child <laughs> of the revolution. Listeners, Uh-oh. this is where things get kind of dark. So are you ready for it? I I guess. All right, here we go. At age six, Frida got polio and it crippled her right leg, which made it grow shorter than her left. And it gave her a little bit of a limp Mm. and actually would give her trouble for the rest of her life. But she became kind of a loner due to the long recovery time. And when she did go to school, she was bullied because her legs were a little bit different. You know, kids can be really mean. Um, So she had to endure that. While she was recovering at home, she and her photographer dad became close. And Frida supposedly was her dad's favorite. So it's kind of sweet. He pushed her to do sports, right? He taught her mm-hmm. how to box. He taught her how to wrestle because he really wanted her to strengthen her right leg. <laughs> that that sounds like a dad thing. Really? Yeah, he's like, he blows his whistle. He comes out in a windbreaker tucked into his khakis. <laughs> He's got a dad-approved plan. I got my dad-approved plan (laughs) right here first. Boxing, then taekwondo, followed by fencing. We're going to strengthen that leg. And then, Steph, he starts to tear up a little bit. Okay. I mean, you can't see see it because it's hiding behind his his Oakley sunglasses. (laughs) But, um, you know, cut to a different angle and you see behind his back, he's holding his dusty childhood baseball glove. (laughs) What? And then flashback, we see that his father was always too busy to play (laughs) baseball with him. Okay. American baseball. Yeah. Okay. All right. So at age 18, 
Frida was in a horrific bus accident. There was a metal railing that impaled her abdomen. Basically, it just shattered her body. Her pelvic bone, her was right fractured. leg was broken in 11 places. Her spine had been broken in and her collar, three her places. shoulder was dislocated. And then later, doctor discovered that she had three more vertebrae broken in her spine. So there is a lot of lore surrounding Frida. Like there are just things that seem unbelievable. Like no way. That's totally made up. (laughs) Well, one of those examples is how Frida was found at the scene of the bus accident. Somehow most, if not all of her clothes were thrown off in the collision. So she was pretty much naked and covered in blood from all of the life burning injuries. And it's said that she was also covered in gold dust in gold leaf uh, uh, apparently there had been an artisan on the bus okay. some artisan of some kind with a cone full of gold leaf so okay. she's naked bloody and covered in gold okay that just sounds like too detailed it's to yeah it, i don't know but whatever i'll believe i choose to believe it you choose right uh the accident happened kind of far away from frida's home in coyacan it was in mexico city and when her parents found out what kind of a state she was in in the hospital, yeah. they were too distraught to visit her. So it took Frida months to recover from this. Honestly, like years. She's she's going to spend the rest of her life recovering from this accident. And for a long time, it was unknown whether she would ever be able to even walk again. Yeah. Like after they established that, oh, OK, she's going to live. That was the first thing. Is she going to yeah. live? And then is she going to walk? She was bedridden for a long time before they realized that she would be able to walk. And to pass the time, her parents fashioned um, a painting easel uh, that she could paint on while she was recovering in bed. So eventually she left the hospital and she was able to recover at home. So that is when she started painting. She really did not have any sort of ambition before this to become an artist whatsoever. She actually wanted to be a doctor. So because of her injuries, Frida wore a plaster corset most of her life. And to make the best of it, as you can see here, (laughs) she's painted the sickle and hammer on it. And there's also a fetus. She's lifting up her dress. (laughs) It looks like a cape. She looks like a communist superhero. (laughs) She sure does. I mean, she was lucky to have health care at all. Um, health care wasn't nationalized in Mexico at this point. And in fact, Frida and Diego would use much of their income to pay for the surgeries Frida would continue to have for the rest of her life. She must have realized health care was a human right. She actually has a painting called peace on earth so the Marxist science may save the sick and those oppressed by criminal Yankee capitalism. That's quite a title. Uh, Yeah, she painted that near the end of her life. Like, totally Uh, no fucks left. Yeah, so there's an orbiting, disembodied head of Karl Marx and he is choking an American eagle. Uh, Pretty pretty blunt. Pretty blunt, Frida. So keep in mind all of the injuries that Frida has now sustained. Yeah. Um, Even though she's healing, her body will never be the 18 year old body that she had she's never going to 100 yeah, percent recover it's no surprise that when frida became pregnant early on in her mm. marriage with diego that she decided to get an abortion right she just knew that it might kill her to carry the baby yeah to carry absolutely. the baby maybe not even carry it to full term right right she might die the baby might die right All right, listeners, let's pick back up in Detroit, where Diego is beginning to paint the Detroit industry murals that we discussed in part one. Luckily for Diego, he was distracted from all of the suffering that surrounded he and Frida. He had a deadline and he had to complete these murals. Yeah, so he's really sucked into those murals. He's working these 10, 12, 20 hour days at the DIA. Frida's opinion of the U.S. was wavering after the inequality and the filthy rich assholes (laughs) she was frequently in contact with. While she felt enamored with San Francisco, which, if you recall, she called it the city of the world, she is now, through the lens of several American cities, seeing who she is. When you're living in a new place, especially when you're by yourself, you tend to really connect with who you are, what your roots are in those cases, because you have all that time to compare and contrast your life to the people around you. Right. And uh, these three cities that she visited, San Francisco, Detroit, and New York, they're all very 
very different cities mm-hmm. and she had very different experiences in all of them, except with, you know, the one common theme, which was poverty and the huge wealth gap. Yeah. But they, I feel like she probably learned something in each one, yeah. something that all contributed to her new identity. So Frida is now surrounded by the stagnant smog of industry, the religion of industry, Gentiles only signs, soup lines, people sleeping in ditches. She's engaging in social outings with patrons who she couldn't care less about. I mean, she was even like pretty openly hostile towards them. Why wouldn't you be? She feels pain for these people, right? The poor. And while Diego is making money, most of his money is going towards supplies, her medical expenses and to her family back home in Mexico. Yeah. He's supporting a dozen people. Um, And not to mention how much it costs to rent a room near the Detroit Institute of Arts, the DIA. I mean, I relate. Like, she must have felt the angst that sometimes we feel in in much smaller doses, of course. When the burden is on the individual to always, like, you're the one who has to help. It has to be charity from you. Um, Then you know you're in a backwards country because... You can't possibly do all that. No matter how much you want to, you can help as much as you can. But at some point in time, you're going to need the resources to help. How many times do you see uh, one of your friends posting about like a GoFundMe? They're trying to raise money for their medical expenses. Medical expenses. Or for someone they know whose house burned down and they need money to like recover everything. We shouldn't have to do this. We we could all be on the same level. Yeah, and the common refrain to that is, well, yo, you don't want the government doing these things. You're right. I don't want the government doing these things. I want people in the government who are taking control of these things. I want like my money to benefit everybody, my yeah. taxes to benefit everybody. So Diego, he's enamored with his industry and the power, like we said, for it to become this utopic communist world he envisioned. But I think what we're getting to is Frida... She's very skeptical of this power and then who is going to wield the power because she sees these people who are being ignored by the people with the power. Right. They have the means. So in Detroit, Diego had begun work on those massive Detroit industry murals that we covered in our last episode. Frida, on the other hand, she's living in their rented hotel suite. It's near the DIA, so she actually can't hide from all the drop-ins. All these people wanting to check in on Diego to visit Frida. They're all obsessed with them, right? Oh, God. She's juggling all this, right? She doesn't have any time to spend alone with herself, which means that she's not spending enough time working on her own artwork. And then Frida feels a familiar feeling of queasiness, of sickness, and she realizes it's similar to the feeling of her first pregnancy. It turns out that, yes, she is pregnant, and you can imagine that she's very conflicted. Yeah, so Frida and Diego, their relationship, for those of you who don't know, it was it was complicated, right? And it was none of our business. <laughs> well, so yeah, the relationship was very messy and, yes, verging on toxic, toxic yeah, at times. Yeah, exactly. But what's clear is that they loved each other dearly and mm-hmm. they cared for each other deeply. Yeah, they, they definitely had no shortage of love for one another, that's for sure. Despite all their drums. So this time around, Frida is very conflicted. The doctor she trusted back in San Francisco has her back, but she's speaking with her doctors in Detroit who are reassuring her, no, we have the best of everything here. It's, it's you Henry can have Ford. This baby. It's, it's the Henry Ford Hospital, Stephanie. I mean, he can build a car. <laughs> he, he can run a plant in Brazil. Of course he can run a hospital. He has the best men. You can totally You're have fine. this baby. Just have a C-section. You'll be fine. Yeah. You'll be fine. But Frida rightfully thought, could my body that had been through such a horrific accident, could it really carry a baby? (laughs) Diego was also concerned for Frida's health. His own mother almost died while giving birth to Diego and his twin brother. They were some big boys, both of them. I mean, they're babies. They're big boys. But twins, that's double duty. Um, (laughs) Big twins. And then he had a baby with another woman years back who actually died while they were still an infant, Mm. his first son. Really sad. So he's been through some shit too, right? Yeah. I mean, but if I'm Friego stuff, if I'm Friego, <laughs> yeah, you got me. Uh, I'm thinking this baby is going to be, it's going to be some sort of like super communist baby. You know what I mean? No, please tell me more. It's like you got the, you got the blood of the child of the revolution, Frida Kahlo. In your veins. Yeah, in your veins. You got Diego, the, the art, the artist poet, the Marxist artist poet. That baby is going to lead the revolution. That baby is going to come out of the womb with a full Karl Marx beard. Ew. And a sickle for an arm, <laughs> probably from some of the leftover shrapnel. That baby oh stuff, that baby God. has an umbilical cord of redistribution that is going to use to lasso around the bourgeoisie. Okay. Look, what's that up in the sky? 
it's communist baby. Wow. Okay. That's like borderline Marvel comic. Yeah. Like a Mr. America yeah. parallel. Yeah. Mr. Kami. No, that's terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> can't get rid of that. Okay. Uh, so while Frida is comforted by the doctor saying that she could have a C-section, she is becoming more and more skeptical that her body would actually be able to handle the pregnancy. Yeah. But health reasons aside, she wasn't even sure if she even wanted to be a mother. Yeah. I mean, she was very conflicted. She did want to have a child with Diego, but she also wanted to get more serious about painting. Yeah, you don't want to throw a super communist baby in there and mix that all up. <laughs> okay. You want to breastfeed that thing. What? It's got a, it's got a sickle for an arm. You don't want to breastfeed it. You're writing a comic book right now. I'm just saying you, the, the likelihood of losing a nipple is pretty high. You, oh my God, okay. She decided to listen to her body despite the doctor's reassurance. Mm. So she went back to the doctor in Detroit and asked for an abortion, explaining her fear that carrying this baby could kill her, the fetus... Or she and the fetus. Yeah. Abortion, even in life-threatening circumstances, was illegal. So Mm -hmm. she was out of luck. The doctor instead gave her some medication and castor oil, which was a combination known to trigger a premature birth, resulting in essentially an abortion. Mm -hmm. But it was not always foolproof. And that was the case for Frida. The concoction didn't work and she was still pregnant. Mm -hmm. Frida at this time started to believe that birth was natural, that technology could assist her, right? And that maybe she could have this baby. Maybe the doctors were right. Maybe she was just being like too paranoid. She should trust the technology. Don't trust her body that's telling her (laughs) that this might not be a good idea. Right. Maybe it's meant to be, right? Maybe. Maybe she should have the baby. It'll be fine. So for several months, she became open to this and even hopeful about this new life that's growing inside of her. Doctors today actually agree with Frida's skepticism that she wouldn't have been able to carry this child to term. Oh, really? They've actually suggested that Frida might have had something called Asherman syndrome, which is basically scar tissue built up in the uterus from when she was impaled by that hand oh, railing. Oh, my God. You know? Okay. So that scar tissue would have prevented her from carrying the child to term. Yeah. On July 4th, 1932, Frida woke up to her sheets soaked in blood. Crimson plumes spread across the white sheets like bright red fireworks would stretch across the night sky come sundown. Frida was hemorrhaging blood. She immediately knew that she should have trusted her body, that she now was experiencing a miscarriage. And for Frida, no hospital visit is ever routine. (laughs) No. She was rushed to Henry Ford Hospital, where she spent the next two weeks in agony, experiencing fever, pain, and hallucinations as she suffered through a miscarriage that was also threatening her life. This experience was painful. And I mean, painful doesn't even put it into words, right? There there are no words. I can't even imagine. Uh, Yeah. I mean, obviously, like, it probably brought her back to that hospital bed when she was 18, too. Well, and probably just bringing back that, like, helplessness and loneliness, right? And it seems like from her letters, she was really looking forward to it. But the doctors didn't listen to her concerns, right? And they gave her false hope. Yeah, and put her life at risk. So Frida had written to a doctor friend that she trusted, quote, Doctorcito querido, I have wanted to write to you for a long time, more than you can imagine. I had so looked forward to having a little Dieguito that I cried a lot, but it's over. There is nothing else that can be done except to bear it. End quote. So, listeners, Frida only completed five paintings during her time in Detroit, but they were a turning point in her career. Today, they're considered to be as monumental as Diego's Detroit Industry murals, although they're only a fraction of the size. Diego would go on to say about Frida's work at this time, quote, Frida began work on a series of masterpieces which had no precedent in the history of art. Paintings which exalted the feminine qualities of endurance, of truth, reality, cruelty, and suffering. Never before had a woman put such agonized poetry on canvas as Frida did at this time in Detroit. End quote. Steph, did I, did I sound like you when I said an end quote? You wish. Mm, I think I did a pretty good job. <laughs> 
So Frida did make a lot of work in response to her experience at the Henry Ford Hospital. This piece, Henry Ford Hospital, is a similar size as Self-Portrait on the Border and the same medium. It's also oil on tin, which is inspired by retablo paintings. So Stephanie, what is a retablo? A retablo is a small devotional painting that memorializes a near-fatal event while also giving thanks to a saint because that person survived the event. Okay. So we're giving Because of the saint. (laughs) Yes, some sort of holy intercession by God, the Virgin Mary, or any of the like hundreds and thousands of saints that there are. For example, Frida, she could have painted the bus accident, right? And then she could have written or she could have painted a description on the bottom telling what happened basically. So there's descriptions usually on the bottom. Yes. And they were usually made on small rectangular sheets of metal. Mm. When I first saw them, when I first learned about them, I thought to myself, this kind of looks like a kindergarten project. When you like paint something or paint something, yeah, you make a drawing and then on the bottom, you know how, because you're a kid, you're learning how to write. Mm -hmm. They have those dashes and like the lines guiding you to... To fill in the spaces. Yeah. It kind of looks like that. And would you say they were painted on again? They're painted on tin. There they are. I thought thought they were gone. I thought they were on vacation, but they're they're here. They're here. Uh, well, let's go feed our Art Pontremon babies. I bet their tummies are rumbling. They are not happy. They're happy to see us, but they're not happy that they're hungry. Artists have been using aluminum, tin, copper, and other metals as alternatives to canvas since the very early Renaissance, about the 15th century. Artists who used metals were seduced by its ultra-slick surface, meaning that the oil paint would glide smoothly without the speed bumps that are natural to surfaces like canvas, linen, and even woods. Many artists will scuff up the metal surface before painting in order to actually slow down the slickness of that oil paint because it's just so smooth. Metal also won't absorb the oil paint like fabric and wood will, especially if they were poorly primed. So that actually results in a higher pigment load on the surface of the metal. There also might have been an issue with mold, mildew, insects, rodents uh, nibbling away at their canvases at this time. So that could be another reason why a lot of artists switch to metals. This was likely how the tradition of painting on metal made its way from Europe to Mexico. Often folksy Mexican retablo paintings were painted on tin, a type of painting that both Frida and Diego collected. Painters and photographers actually still use metals today, especially aluminum and copper, to both paint and print on. Metals, of course, can oxidize in the wrong type of air, so artists, if you're using metal, you need to be very careful and seal up any exposed metal surfaces with, like, a varnish, or some sort of protective coat. Russell, thank you so much for that art pantry entry. Our little pantrymon babies, their tummies are satiated. I'm so glad they're still here. But let's get back to the episode. So Frida's painted a portrait of herself in this desolate landscape. She is so small in this giant cold hospital bed with painted letters saying Henry Ford Hospital. Kind of as if to say this place did this to me. She looks like she's in a jail cell. Kind of, yeah, if a jail cell was a bed. She's in a pool of blood, and she has giant teardrops, like (laughs) anime-sized, falling down her face. She's holding six red strings, or they might be umbilical cords, and they're floating away from her. Tied to the end of them are six different objects. We'll just talk about a couple of them. One of them is a male fetus. Mm-hmm. Her baby that she miscarried had been a boy. Okay. And then another one is a snail. That one I was wondering about. <laughs> You're wondering about that one. Yeah. Okay. Well, apparently it symbolizes just how long the miscarriage took. Seems like she's trying to keep these things inside of her body. That's that's the way I'm reading it. Like she's holding her her broken body and she's she's holding on to these umbilical cords. I'm not sure. It's it's really strange. Yeah. But which, whatever it is, I think you're right. I think yeah. it's a part of her. It's an extension of her. Which Frida used those, I, I don't know if they're on umbilical cords or strings or whatever they are. She used them very frequently in yeah. her work after this painting. Kind of reminds me of this, I don't know if it's a superstition mm-hmm. of red string in Mexico. Red string is used as protection against the mal de ojo, the evil eye. So okay. You, so you would maybe put that around the baby's wrist. Like my little niece got one for my grandma as soon as she was born she put a little, <laughs> little red uh, red string around her wrist um, but that, basically uh, it's for that evil eyes looking for those young babies they're the most Fresh vulnerable <laughs> 
Aw. Anyway, she's alone in this barren landscape except for a Detroit industry skyline looming in the horizon. It's pretty ominous. It's pretty spooky. There had not really been any paintings depicting miscarriages up until this point. Frida is putting her pain on display, which is like shocking and heartbreaking all at once. Because Frida is making herself vulnerable, because she's putting herself out there, people can look at this painting and be like, Mm -hmm. oh my God. Gosh, yeah. I also went through this. Or if you don't relate to it directly, you're at least creating some kind of awareness, right? By putting it out there. Yeah. In this painting, it, it just screams that her body is not her own body. Like she has, she has lost control of her body. To me, right. that, that's that's how I read it, of course. And I would think in doing this, allowing herself to be vulnerable and to just paint these horrific experiences, it, it had to be cathartic. It had to be some sort of therapy for her at this point. Yeah. She's dealing with like this pain that no one was really equipped to talk to her about. Right. So she had to express it through painting. You're absolutely right. To this day, there's still a stigma and shame around abortions and miscarriages. Yeah. Women don't often announce their pregnancy until after 12 weeks, which is when there's less of a chance that a miscarriage will Mm -hmm. happen. So then they don't have to tell people that the baby didn't make it, right? That's sort of implying that it's the mother's fault. But there are so many factors that go into the possibility of having a miscarriage. Everyone is entitled to keep it private, right? You don't have to share that. But if we did, though, it could be a collective mourning, right? When like a loved one passes away, Mm. a community could come together to help the affected ones heal. So it's not so like alien eating, right? Yeah. No one talks about it. It happens probably more often than we even realize. So here is Frida in 1932 just putting it out there. She's just like, fuck it. I'm hurting. This happened. She's doing Mm. this for herself. And in doing so, she's telling people they're not alone. It's really sad, but you're right. It's reaching a lot of people. And to top it all off, Frida wasn't allowed to mourn. She asked the doctors to see her baby when she'd miscarried and, and they refused. So she wasn't able to get any closure, I guess. Right. And she needed that. She needed to see her baby to get that closure. Yeah. Death is not something that that's feared in Mexican culture. Like, that was not strange to Frida. Right. So an American patient, they probably wouldn't have shown it to them because they thought they would be hysterical. Maybe. That's just kind of cruel to it's, me. Yeah. They're making the decision so on behalf of the woman. Like, oh, she's not in the right state of mind. Fuck you. She just had a miscarriage. Like, come on. Like I was saying, death was not something that was feared or dreaded in Mexico. Mm. It's it, it was sad, but it's also something that's celebrated. But this was yet another blow to Frida. Yeah. So not only was she just ignored to some degree by her doctor. I mean, yes. w- whether they wanted to do that or they just couldn't do anything about it because of the laws at that time. She's just put in this horrible situation. They're also pushing the doctors are pushing their culture right onto mm. her or their patients by not allowing her to see the baby. Right. And she needed that closure. Unfortunately, Frida would suffer another blow just a couple months later when her mother back in Mexico became very sick. Even though she was still bleeding from time to time due to the recent miscarriage, she rushed to Mexico by train because planes were still only accessible to the wealthy. Okay. Sound familiar? Like, uh... Max Ernst and Peggy Guggenheim (laughs) flying to the United States to flee the Nazis? Yeah. Yeah. But, counterpoint, they didn't get to get on the uh, limbo boat like the three witches. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. She boarded a train, left Detroit, and then headed down through the south toward the Mexican border in Texas. This was a long journey. It took days with many stops in U.S. cities. At some stops, Frida was still so ill from the miscarriage that she missed strolling through the cities entirely. At other stops, Frida witnessed not only more poverty, but also more overt racism against Blacks and Mexicans alike. Yeah, listeners, we're actually looking at a photograph of Frida. She's standing next to the quote-unquote Negro section of the train. The train station. The train station. And she is given a stink eye. Major stink eye. Because she is not all about this segregation. She doesn't like it. Justified stink eye. Yeah. Frida made it to Mexico in time to see her mother before she passed away. The sudden death of her mother, though, was devastating. Yeah. So she goes from losing her chance to become a mother to losing her own mother in just a matter of a few months. I have no words. I can't imagine. I can't imagine what she's going through. Being back in Mexico, though, for Frida was bittersweet because she had been so homesick, right? She did enjoy going to the market, buying little Mexican toys and eating sweet treats. Everything I've read about Frida says she just loves her sweet treats. 
like her little everyone, toys. Everyone. Sounds like me. <laughs> I'm going to compare myself to Frida, but... So before Frida left, her father, who, like we said, was a photographer, he actually shared photos he had taken recently. And Stephanie, do you know where they were from? Do you know? I'm guessing... Something industrial? Mr. America Henry Ford had recently opened up a new Ford motor factory in Mexico City. Naturally, naturally. Frida is back on the train and she's able to connect all of these disparate impressions of these places that she's experienced. Mm. From the streets of her hometown in Coyacan to the Embarcadero in San Francisco to the skyscrapers in New York City and to the sprawling factories in Detroit. Mm. She's been she's been a lot of places now. Yeah. She's experienced the duality firsthand. The duality that Diego romanticized and warned against in his murals. But Frida didn't get to romanticize it. She had to survive it. Mm. It's a good point. Something changed when she crossed the border back into the U.S. Mm. to reunite with Diego in Detroit. Something changed. Sometimes you need to step out of your home to realize who you are and why you are the way you are you have to leave home when she would come back to detroit she would insist on having a studio space in the dia she's done fucking around (laughs) she's like it's time for me to be taken seriously i'm free to call i got stuff to say i got stuff to say i've lived this life i'm only 26 years old but i live this fucking life and i have stuff to say i mean the last six months alone a lot of people go through that much pain in a whole lifetime yeah i can't even imagine And maybe she's realizing, too, life is short. Life is short. Get to doing what you love. Hey, listeners, real quick, just so you know, you can still grab a three-pack of the Art Slice stickers, including the uh, creepy, creepy, creepy bumper (laughs) sticker that says, listen to Art Slice or the devil will get you. Sorry about that. It's from a billboard that we saw somewhere in, I don't know, the south of America, somewhere. And it comes with a holographic sticker that I'm hiding from Stephanie so she doesn't take them all. I don't know where the stash is. And a clear sticker as well. They look good on cars, bicycles, laptops, water bottles. But you can put them on butts. Put it on your cat's butt, too, if you want to. That would be a little mean. (laughs) Anyway, we're going to get back to the episode. Just head on over to our website or our Instagram. Grab a pack. It really does help support the show. All right, listeners. Like in Diego's Detroit Industry murals, there's a lot of meaning and symbols in Frida's work. Even in just this one painting... So we're going to talk about a few of the symbols we think sum up the work well. Okay, listeners. So if you don't have On the Border right in front of you, uh, we're going to give you the basic breakdown. The composition, it it's split into two sides. There's the Mexican side on our left and the American side on our right. So Frida, she's standing on a pedestal in this elegant cotton candy colored dress, smack dab in the middle, in the center of the composition, and on the borderline between the United States and Mexico, like the title states, and everything in the composition is happening around her. Well, and unlike Henry Ford Hospital, if you recall, listeners, the landscape surrounding her is not desolate, okay? It's populated now with all kinds of things from flora to ruins to... You guessed it, more technology and industry. So let's start with Frida herself. Like Russell said, she's standing directly on the border. Already, she's come a long way from hemorrhaging on that cold hospital bed, naked and alone. But now she's standing tall, proud and upright and wearing the most feminine dress I could think of off the top (laughs) of my head, even if I wasn't trying. There are these light bulbs that are plugged into an electrical socket in the stone base on the pedestal. But Frida, she's standing there like an absolute boss. She's smoking despite Henry Ford not allowing cigarettes anywhere (laughs) near the Ford factory. Flicking her cigarette ashes into the American side like you stupid ashtray country. (laughs) And of course, like we said, her cotton candy pink dress. That's um. That is, uh, Stephanie, would you call this sheer? No. Sheer, thin, kind of thin. A thin fabric, a very thin fabric, possibly. Close to the bod. Close to the body. <laughs> thin and close to the body. She is a boss here. She's in control, even if her surroundings don't seem that yeah, way. Yeah, they seem really out of, uh, out of her control. So, like we mentioned before, Frida shied away from dressing in that traditional Tijuana style to fit in with the more European dress that was in vogue with Diego's patrons. But now that she's crossed back into the U.S say from Mexico. She's like, you want me to wear your stupid dress? I'll wear your stupid dress, but you're going to wish I was wearing my Tawana dress when you see my ice cold nipples peeking out. Okay. 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 They're very apparent, Steph. Pointing at us. (laughs) Yeah. 
So she has this sort of smug attitude on her face, and she's kind of looking at us like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> like, which part, right? The cigarette? I got a cigarette. The nips, I got nips. The... Got a little Mexican flag. <laughs> And she's also wearing these white lacy gloves to just top it off. Frida seems all prim and proper for a socialite outing with the upper crust of the Motor City. That sounds really weird, those two things together. <laughs> but she's got this little Siggy, okay? She's got a Mexican flag. And she's brawless, girl. She's sick of dealing with these folks who couldn't care less if, like, these if people were dying on the street, which they were. Yeah. Her nips are double birds to the bourgeoisie. The double bees to the bees, the bourgeoisies. <laughs> okay. Her English was not so perfect, and she used this to her advantage by <laughs> saying outrageous things in slightly off English. Yeah, but totally on purpose. Right. It would leave everyone wondering if she had meant what she said. Like, yeah. did she really know what she was saying? <laughs> she sure did. Frida, of course, herself, she had a she had a potty mouth in English and in Spanish, especially <laughs> in Spanish, apparently. But Diego, he was like, yeah, keep doing this. Like, she would mention things about communism. She would mention things that would just kind of upset the Rich, and then Friego, Stephanie, Friego, there you go again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They would have a good laugh about it when she got home. Yeah, the people who knew, her, who really knew her and were around when she did this, they knew what was really going yeah, on. just fucking And with they them. thought it was funny, right, exactly. So probably the best example of this, listeners, if you recall from part one, Henry's son, Edsel, you know, the guy with the, that huge pile huge of gold. Huge pile of gold. <laughs> so the one who had paid for Diego's commission. So that meant that Diego and Frida would spend a lot of time with the Fords because and all of their wealthy friends. Because when patrons buy your art, they're also buying access to you. Don't forget that. And they had, by the way, Stephanie, they had to do this sober. Oh my gosh, what? Prohibition hadn't ended yet. It was what? about to. It was about to end. Oh my god. But yeah, they had to do this sober. I mean, I would be pulling out my nipples too if I had to do this sober. I can't deal with that. Yo, and then it's the depression. Like, no. oh no, no. All right, so Frida, Frida did not like Henry Ford. Mr. America Ford? She did not like what? Henry Ford. <laughs> Why, Steph? He's, he's Mr. America Ford. Well, I mean, Was there's... it the Brazilian rainforest? <laughs> right, where to was start? Was it his best friend Adolf Hitler? Was it the Dearborn Independent? Uh, was it all the layoffs and the deaths? Or was it the machine guns that his police and security guards fired at the protest? What was it? It could have been any one of those. Those are all just common mistakes that any businessman will make at any point in time in his career. Well, so... <laughs> He's just a great person. No. <laughs> all right. So one evening at a social gathering, Mr. Ford had taken a real liking to Frida. They Ooh. danced together. They were having a good time, laughing it up. He offered her a free car, which <laughs> Diego denied on Frida's behalf, by the way, saying it was too lavish, of course. Classic yep. communist. Um, and hey, hey, if I was Frida, <laughs> I would take that car, spray paint a big old uh, hammer and sickle on it. Okay. Just do wheelies. Just do wheelies <laughs> in the Ford parking lot. Hell yeah. Just blaring the international on my phonogram or whatever the fuck I have. And I got my I got my double B's outside the window. Double B's to the bourgeoisies. I don't know how I'm driving. I was going to say, how are you driving? <laughs> All right. So they're having a good time. And then, of course, it's that time of night. Ford's had so many drinks. And then that, that they, subject they, they comes up. Drinks. His favorite. Huh? Ford hasn't had any drinks. Okay. You don't think he's sneaking alcohol from across Henry the border? Henry Ford was a well-known anti-alcoholic. Are you serious? Yeah. He I didn't, didn't know that. He was a teetoter. What? Yeah, he didn't touch the stuff. What? Yeah, he didn't allow smoking. He, didn't, he In Brazil, when he took over the rainforest, that little area of the rainforest, <gasps> oh God, he wouldn't allow right. drinking, he wouldn't allow smoking, he wouldn't oh. allow sex. Oh, monster. He's a Nazi. I mean, he was a Nazi monster. sympathizer. Ew. All right, so eventually that time of night comes around where Ford's had, you know, enough Kellogg cornflakes at this point. And or not enough. Or not his urges, enough. His urges are slightly rising. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, his favorite subject comes up, you know. The, the Jews. Jews. The Jews, yeah. And Frida, she just couldn't help herself. I mean, how many times do you think she had to sit through one of his... One of his, like, the Jews are taking over the world rant? His rants, yep. There's, like, a pause, right? Because no one, no one's going to say anything to him. Yeah, everyone's about like, here, here goes quiet. Henry Ford and right. his, his harmless anti-Jewish rants. For... Well, they stay quiet, and Frida's just like, yeah, now's the time. Um, Mr. Mr. Ford, is it true that you're Jewish? <laughs> Frida's just not holding back anymore. She doesn't give a shit. Her words, Stephanie, they're like ice cold nipples, sharp in the icy Detroit <laughs> air. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, she just she just totally loathed the fact that the only people in the U.S. that could have influence were like scoundrels. And she hated hypocrites. And she questioned how Diego could have such admiration for Ford. Right. Because think about who else had such admiration for yeah. him. Hitler. Yeah. For different reasons. But still, she questioned it. 
Back to on the border. So we see these beautiful flowers on the Mexican side on our left. And then we see these tungsten lights on the right side. Stephanie, it also looks like an old school heat lamp, you know, to keep your chickens warm in the winter. Make sure they're laying eggs. Uh, I wouldn't know about those. Okay. Anyway, (laughs) so digging through the earth in those worm tracks, the worm tracks that we talked about that I like to draw as a kid, are those electrical (laughs) cords and they're moving through the soil like roots. They almost feel like an invasive weed. And these electrical roots, they're actually seeking out the roots of of the natural foliage. For, for the plants, whatever. <laughs> I'm questioning and, it. But anyway, they, they want to choke out those beautiful natural flowers. Um, these black hordes are like tentacles that are digging through the border. And they would have gone unnoticed if it weren't for Frida pointing it out with her Siggy. Yeah, she's saying industry under the control of people like Henry Ford is unnatural and invasive. To me, it seems that this is directly related to learning about Ford's expansion into Mexico City. Uh, When it opened, she might have thought, well... People need jobs. They need to eat. But now after living in Detroit and honestly just seeing other (laughs) cities in the U.S., she sees how this could be a high cost to the people. Yeah. And she's worried about her uh, people back in Mexico City. On the Mexican side, on the ground, there are a bunch of flora, right? A bunch of plants, a bunch of flowers. Yeah, the ones the uh, electrical lights are trying to choke out. Above the flora, though, we have two pre-Columbian fertility figures and a skull. They're all centuries old, so in a way, they are witnesses, right? They've survived time, erosion, and fallen empires. So the fertility figures, one... Looks like it was breastfeeding, yeah. but the uh, the baby's head is missing. I think this is clearly about Frida's miscarriage. Yeah. One of the idols, the other one is giving birth upright, so standing up, which was the norm because it's common sense to let gravity help you. <laughs> yeah. Frida wouldn't have been given the opportunity to do that, even if she could carry a baby to term. Mm. So opposite the fertility figures are those steampunk looking smoke vents. <laughs> I'm not really sure what those are. The vents aren't pointed upwards like the Ford vents behind them. They're actually pointed directly at Mexico. They have these long extended pipes that look like arms. I I don't know. I read them as guards of the United States (laughs) or maybe they're soldiers that are about to fight with the the pre-Columbian spirits of the Aztecs. I don't know. There's some sort of invaders slash protectors. They, They just have like a very nefarious vibe to them. Diego had this romantic vision of how the world could use industry. I mean, he also showed the dark side of that in his murals. But Frida doesn't seem to have a positive vision. She doesn't have something positive to say. She only seems to be showing us the negative side. So once again, Diego thought that industry, you know, humans being replaced by machines coupled with a like a political revolution would lead humanity to a place beyond scarcity where folks could focus on what they wanted to do, what they love to do and work like minimal hours. <laughs> but I, I think Frida, <laughs> she's countering Diego saying that it doesn't necessarily lead to an abundance and equality. It could just mean that industry would consume smaller, less developed countries and mine them for other resources or (laughs) or cheap labor, let's say. And the workers in those poorer countries would really have no option but to accept those wages. And then the out-of-work Americans would be out on the street just like she saw firsthand in every city she went. So, Diego is Star Trek. Frida is, uh, like, Mad Max. (laughs) Yeah. And remember that she is coming from a time in Mexico that was very aware of their place as a formerly colonized country that gained their independence, but then had a civil war between basically the ruling class and the working class. So she may have seen the capitalist advances almost like a new form of colonization. Yeah, that's a good point. But on the Mexican side, we have an Aztec pyramid that's in ruins. Okay, the Aztecs were an intelligent and innovative civilization, um, but they were very powerful which means that they had to resort to violence and war to gain the kind of power that they Mm. had. 
Um, And like all great empires, they fall for one reason or another, and we're left with the ruins. And then in comparing the Aztecs to modern civilization, Aztecs were considered savages, right? Or just like a lot of native people were considered savages, okay? Um, Because often they were polytheistic, and here above the ruins, we have the sun, moon, and lightning hovering above the pyramid, and Mm -hmm. each one of them represents an Aztec god, okay? So directly across the border on the American Mm -hmm. side, we have an American flag okay. that's hovering above the Ford factory and the skyline. Huh. Um, so it's dissipating into the cloud of polluting smoke that's coming from the four Ford smokestacks, and each one of the smokestacks has an F O R D. She really didn't like Ford. I no, feel like she I don't think she really so. is sticking it to him, just yeah. like she wrote his name on the hospital bed in Henry Ford Hospital. Yeah. Here she's like, hey, in case y'all forgot. <laughs> The flag only exists within this pollution smoke, and it doesn't stand on its own because modern America is a byproduct of the misuse of resources Mm -hmm. and labor. Uh, The Ford factory is producing the smoke that makes the flag, right? So Ford makes the USA go round. And then to counter that, right, Frida has an actual flag, a little flag. It's real. It's it's real. Yeah, it's yeah. a little Mexican flag. Her flag is tangible. It's small, but it's there. It's real. Interesting. It's not dissipating in a cloud of pollution smoke. Okay. I mean, so it's similar to Diego's mural, right? The giant ear in Diego's mural. That ear was a warning to the workers that mm, management right. is always listening. But Frida isn't warning workers. She's warning Mr. America. She's taking on the Mr. F-dog. Henry Ford. <laughs> Yeah, it's awesome. It's it's badass. She's saying like, look at these Aztec ruins. They were once a great civilization. Contrasting it is the massive, new, bright, shining, uh, but also industrially smoggy America, <laughs> right. right? So I think she's saying in this big fish gets eaten by the bigger fish world, you might be next to Mr. Ford. And instead of holding up a mirror to the factory like Diego did, she's saying, hey, Mr. Ford, come here, check out, uh, check out my crystal ball here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, of course. Stephanie. Yes? When we take apart the River Rouge plant oh. with the help of the giant Michigan cherry golems. Okay. And we take those deconstructed parts and we construct the Art Slice Museum on the Art Slice Hilltop with its free snacks, its free nap pods, its free <laughs> hot tub clusters at each corner of the museum gardens with, of course, a free bar. <laughs> are we installing on the border in our permanent collection? Mm. You're hesitating? I thought this was like um, a slam dunk. I thought this was a home run. I, I thought this was like a Stephanie Duenas like <laughs> victory lap. Pulling we, out your sparkly flags, waving them. <laughs> I kind of have the same dilemma as I did with okay. Detroit industry. Well, we did that last time, though. We did what? We did that whole thing last time, though. Or we cloned it. You just want to do that again? I just want to clone it again. Okay. Totally, because well, we can totally do exciting, that but okay. in this year. All right, well, um, okay, wh- whatever. What do you like about the work? Well... As you know, I am (laughs) first generation Mexican Uh and as a first generation Latina woman, I feel like I have been half and half my whole life. Yeah. Um, Like my family's not from here, not from the U.S., but always just feeling like an outsider no matter Mm. where I go, Um, especially when you live and are just always in predominantly white spaces. Gringolandia? Russellandia? What? (laughs) Russellandia? Yeah. No. No. My family not being from here, from the U.S., Mm -hmm. and always feeling like an outsider no matter where you go, especially when you live in predominantly white spaces. Russell (laughs) Andes. No. Um, You're too white for the Mexican crowd, and then you're too, like, other for the white kids. Mm -hmm. And I say other because I am a light-skinned. You're lighter-skinned. Yes. Yeah. But see... But they still sense it. Exactly. It doesn't matter how light your skin is. It's just like, (laughs) oh, no. Like Gotta stay out of the sun. Stay out of the sun. Okay. It's just that feeling of not belonging, right? You're straddling the border between like, what the hell does being American even mean? Yeah, what, what is America? Is it something, something you even want to be? Is it something that you would even be proud of, right? Or 
or am I Mexican? This culture is familiar to me, right? Having gone there growing up and then just being around family, but mm. I have bits and pieces of it. But I grew up thinking, where do I fit in? But you're a million things. Mm. You're complex, right? But I understand having lived in so many places other than my hometown that there's just a time where you just feel like you're neither here nor there. Mm. And it doesn't even have to come down to race or ethnicity necessarily, but just feeling like an outsider, generally speaking. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally get that. And Frida experienced that loneliness too. And she was also like all kinds of dualities and she embraced that as well. It sounds like she was experiencing a lot of what you're saying. And she was on the border of so many different things. She was bi, she was biracial. Like her dad was from Germany and yeah. her mom was Mexican. She actually was a little bit androgynous. She was just like fluid like that, complex like that, which most people are, but she was just totally open about it mm-hmm. in the 1930s. 1930s. Right. So, but she embraced it. She embraced it all. And yet she's still feeling like she's straddling a border. Well, do you do you want my white guy opinion about the work or? <laughs> yes. All opinions welcome. Unless they're rude, then no. Uh, this, this piece is... Is going in the museum for me, totally, easily. Okay. It's not as strong as her other work craft-wise, but that's really not an issue for me. Mm-hmm. We have to remember, first of all, Frida is still learning how to paint here while she's, you know, doing some bangers like yeah. that. Uh, Luther, <laughs> what's his name? Luther Burbank. Luther Burbank. Burbank. She is painting on these tiny tin retablo pieces. Like, she's emulating retablo works. Right. And it's interesting. You can see how this artist couple is influencing one another. Mm-hmm. And Steph and I, like, we influence one another when we work, of course. Yes. Um, but Diego, he was modernizing frescoes. You know, frescoes right. is this really old way of working. And retablos are a really old way of working. And Frida is modernizing those. Mm-hmm. She's not using those spiritual stories, right? Right. Neither she's, was Diego. Yeah. Neither is Diego. Exactly. She's putting in her own pain. She's putting in her own belief system into these works. And the fact that she's hiding on that content in these tiny retablo paintings, it makes them super duper deadly. So if you're used to seeing these things, if you're used to seeing retablo paintings in like Mexico, let's say, or Stephanie, like how many murals have you seen in your life? A lot. How many have you been bored by? A lot. Right. So even <laughs> so like even if they have some interesting content and they're not just like trying to sell lofts in the Castro district. <laughs> right. People are used to seeing murals. People yeah. back then were used to seeing frescoes. So Diego using that medium and then injecting his own like communist belief system that he's trying to like <laughs> yeah. change people with, it makes it deadly. And Frida taking those religious retablos mm-hmm. and putting her own pain and honestly activism into them makes them just as deadly as yeah. Diego's work, but they're in a much smaller package. That's funny that you say that because if you recall André Breton, the leader of the Surrealist movement yeah. in Paris, he actually saw Frida's paintings and he said that they looked like a ribbon wrapped around a bomb. <laughs> so you're like, oh, pretty. And you get up there and then you're just blown to smithereen. You're blown away. No. This, is, this is a quiet bomb. This is a bomb that she's like left in a car. Henry Ford's car and she's about to flick her lit cigarette in it. <laughs> Okay, but seriously, no. Going back to this being a triumphant portrait, Mm -hmm. it is, and it's all good. It's all good and fine. You're like, yes, she's strong, she's confident, but there is something still that shows that she's vulnerable, and it's those little fertile figures. Yeah. Right? One of them doesn't have a baby. Mm -hmm. One of them had a baby, and like its little head's broken off. Yeah. And I feel like that, it's a small part of the painting but that part's just like oh man like that figure had a baby but there's something about vulnerability that makes you even more deadly I think because so many people are afraid to be vulnerable she's owning her pain she's showing you why she's angry and I think Mm -hmm. that's important it's not for nothing you know the why why is there a bomb well she's showing you why there's a bomb there's no mystery there that's the thing about Frida she lays it out there right and you have to read the fine print and the fine print here is actually pretty obvious it's like in red and it's like (laughs) it kind of reminds me of a medicine ad right they're telling you all the good things about (laughs) it and then at the end it's like (gasps) like all these things could happen to you all of these side effects could affect you ask your doctor if capitalism is right for you (laughs) yes exactly you know stephanie it's funny because i never i guess i never thought of frida as a political artist i don't know why i mean i knew she was a feminist icon which is inherently political 
And I knew that she spoke to pain, which is, I guess, also political as well. But for some reason, I never connected the dots that it was it could be political for me, too, <laughs> as a like as a like a white dude. You probably didn't think of her as political because when literally anyone says Frida Kahlo, you think of a million self-portraits. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. But well, it comes you're across like, as vain. It does. Like when, you, when you're looking at it and you don't have that introspection, it's like, oh, well, this is just some like vain artist talking about her pain. Exactly. But that being said, once you take a second to learn about it, you're like, oh, I probably know five people that have been through something that she has like i know someone who's been in a cast i know someone who's been in a tragic accident Mm -hmm. i know someone not me necessarily but like you know someone who's had a miscarriage you know someone who's biracial bisexual what have you and it's like and yes and in being able to relate to that you're like yes i know someone that affects me and if not she's at least creating awareness making you aware that this experience exists in the world yeah thanks for showing it to me and listeners We would like to know what you thought about this piece, whether it would go in your art slice museum or not, your own personal art slice museum that lives in your mind, unlike ours, which is in reality. It's truth. It is real. We are here. It is tactile. We can touch it. We can feel it. Or any of the work that we've discussed in previous episodes. We want to know what you did, what you didn't like about it. You can do that by emailing us, DMing us, or sending us a very short audio recording. And if you're new to Art Slice, you can send in any of the previous art assignments like last episode's mural assignment, tarot card, music abstraction, or the flag assignment so we can post them. Send them all to artslicepod at gmail.com and uh, include your Instagram handle or whatever you want us to tag you on. And listeners, we received even more messages this week. Thank you so much. I say this every week, but it is just Stephanie and I making these episodes, and they take a lot of time to write and record and produce, and that's why we're a little late this time. But we love hearing from you all. We We love the love. Yeah, we love the love. Well, we just love to know that you're interested in in what we're putting down. No. (laughs) No. We just want to to date you, listeners. We just want to go on a a hot date with you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, but we love hearing from you and we love to hear that you're enjoying the podcast. We really do. Yeah. Keep keep sending them over. Actually, we talked to John recently who's making some, first of all, he's making some really great artwork, but he's also working on a documentary called Black People Don't Do Art. It is not out yet, but he has a trailer. Check out his project at Black People Don't Do Art on Instagram. And then you can find his website through there as well. And as a reminder, listeners, you can still grab a pack of Art Slice stickers on our website, on our Instagram page. Uh, It goes to help support the show. You get a bumper sticker with a devil on it. (laughs) You get a holographic sticker and you get a clear sticker. So what, what, honestly, what more do you want from us? Seriously. If you hate stickers, though, you can still support us in other ways. I don't know who would hate stickers. Somebody out there. Okay. I don't know. Anyway, go on. Thinking about everybody. Yeah. You can support us in other ways, though. You can follow us on all of the things. Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube. Um, and sharing, listening, and writing a review on your pod player of choice. It helps us just be visible. It helps us feed the algorithm gods. As a new podcast, it's it's really important to do that. So that extra step it really helps us out, and we really appreciate it. And a very special thank you to musician Chris Keo for letting us use his work. Uh, it's from Processed Harp Works Volume 1 and 2. And seriously, like I really enjoy these two albums. They're amazing. Uh, if you like that type of music, go check them out. We'll link his work on our website. Well, that about does it for us today. We will see you next time, listeners. And no. And no. Your kid could not have painted that. Bye. Bye. Bye.